A couple of Christmases ago, uh, my wife and, and my, my two daughters and myself decided to spend Christmas in Sedgefield in the Western Cape uh, with my mom. And uh, it's, it's a long journey. If any of you guys have done the drive down, you'll know that uh, it's quite a tough drive with small children. Uh, we usually last about half an hour. So we decided to break the trip up into two parts. So we stayed at a place called Colesburg uh, on the way down. And we had booked um, a quaint kind of, a night at a quaint little B&B, one of the kind of quiet back streets of Colesburg. That's a joke, uh, all of Colesburg is a quiet back street. But we, we, we got there and it was a long drive and we, we got out of the car and stretched our legs and we were greeted by the friendliest old man. He kind of came out of the B&B and he said, welcome to Colesburg. We were so surprised, but he, he was just so excited to see us and then he showed us our room and he, he really made us feel super welcome. And then we, we got chatting and, and it turns out that he was the father of a couple that we knew. Now, we, we, di we didn't know the couple all that, um, all that well, but, but you know, he, he was like, uh, so excited, it was almost as if he was treating us as though we were these long lost friends. He said, won't you guys come over for tea? And we said, well look, it's late, you know, we're tired, we, we wanna kinda settle down and get some dinner. Well, what about tomorrow morning after breakfast? Yeah, you see, we, we gotta get to Sedgefield, so not, you know, it's still a long journey, but, but uh, yeah, here's what we'll do. On the way back, okay, we'll see if there's enough time uh, when we stay in Colesburg again to come and have tea at your house. Oh, that's a great idea. He was so happy about that. So anyway, uh, you know, we had breakfast. We headed down to, to Sedgefield. On the way back up to Joburg, we stopped again at Colesburg, and my wife and I were kind of looking at the little leaflet to see uh, what there is to do in Colesburg and realize that there's nothing to do in Colesburg. So we said, well, let's phone this guy and see if we can, you know, we can have a cup of tea. So I phoned him and he was, he was like, yo, come, come have tea. I'll see you guys in a few minutes. So anyway, we, we arrive at his place and we, we knock on the door and we just hear, coming. And then we, we, we hear this awkward kind of thing happen. Um, he, he starts having this conversation with his wife. Um, honey, is it okay if Dave and Lauren um, come for tea? <laughs> Sorry, who? Uh, Dave and Lauren and the two kids, you know, they stayed at the B&B just a couple of weeks ago. They're outside right now. <laughs> They're what? <laughs> yeah, is it okay if they come inside? How can, you, how can you invite people to our home without telling me about it? I'm not ready for guests. I don't have tea. I don't have all of these things, biscuits, cake. She was so upset. Anyway, so you can imagine, we open the door and she's pretending like she really wants us in her house. He has got this guilty, sheepish look on his face. It is so awkward. I promise you, it was the most awkward tea we've ever had. We sat there trying to make conversation with this lady who didn't really want us in her house. But anyway, I don't know if you guys have ever had a similar experience where you've maybe been in someone's house and you've just felt like you're an unwelcome guest. Like it's, it's awkward, like you know you shouldn't be here. Anyone felt like that before? Okay, maybe a couple of us. Well, I wanna tell us an awkward dinner party story this morning from the Bible. Um, so if we could open up our Bibles to Luke chapter seven, I think it's on page 62 uh, in the Bibles in front if you don't have a Bible with you, otherwise you can just follow along on your phone. Luke chapter seven, verse 36 to 50. Okay, here we go. Our awkward dinner party story from the Bible. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. 
Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Okay, so just to kind of introduce you here to, to Simon the Pharisee, uh, for those of you who don't know what, what uh, Pharisees were, Pharisees were kind of the religious teachers in the day of Jesus. They, they taught the people from the Jewish law, from the law of Moses. Uh, they really, really prided themselves in their ability to teach the scriptures, their knowledge of the scriptures, and how well they kept these laws in their own lives. Uh, they were kind of these arrogant sort of people. They, they were sort of top of the food chain. They, they kind of looked down at others and, and you know, they, they sided with the Romans and, and it just, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a pretty thing. But anyway, in this, in this picture, in this story, we have Simon, one of the Pharisees, who invites Jesus to his house for dinner. Now, in those days, the, the homes of sort of well-to-do people like Simon's were, were set uh, around these sort of, the dinner tables were set in these central courtyards. And, and this courtyard kind of had these doors opening up on the sides, and, and the table in the middle had these sort of couches on, on either side, and, and when people sat down for dinner, they sort of lay on these couches, leaning on one elbow with their feet, you can see from the picture, sort of extending away from the table, because the feet were generally the dirty part, you know, people walked all day, so, so you don't want your feet anywhere close to the food. Now, generally, what, what would happen at these dinners is, is very important people would come to these dinner parties and they'd sit around this table and have these kind of big discussions. It wasn't uncommon for Pharisees to invite rabbis who were kind of teachers in the area, maybe guests from, from other towns to these dinner parties. Then what would happen you've organized this dinner, is as your guests came inside your house, it was really, really important that you showed kindness and hospitality to your guests. So it was customary for the host to give whoever came inside a kiss of peace, and then to remove their sandals, and then to wash their dirty feet with water, either when they walked inside or once they were reclining at the table. And then lastly, to anoint the head as a, a sign of blessing with olive oil. Now, when we read the first verse in this text, we assume that Simon was such a nice oak. I mean, he's invited Jesus for dinner at his house. And we know that Jesus often had a run-in with the Pharisees and you know, he wasn't liked amongst the Pharisees and he had tough things to say to them. But maybe it's different here. Maybe Jesus and Simon are like buddies and so Jesus, that's, that's unfortunate. Jesus is, is, is at this guy's house uh, for dinner. But the thing is, as we see later on in the text, Jesus was an unwelcome guest at Simon's house. Simon didn't really want Jesus as a dinner guest at his home. We're not given reasons as to why Jesus was invited to his house for dinner, but I'm kind of putting two and two together, and my guess is that he was kind of invited out of obligation. 
because it was the done thing. Pharisees invited rabbis to their homes for these dinner parties to have these kind of big discussions. And so maybe if, if Simon neglected to invite this popular rabbi, Jesus, to his house, you know, people would maybe kind of turn their heads. But everyone there that evening, including Jesus, could see that Jesus was an unwelcome guest. From the minute that Jesus stepped inside of that house, Simon treated him with callous, calculated contempt. And he purposefully avoided every single dinner custom that meant, was meant to kind of happen. He didn't give Jesus a kiss of peace. He didn't wash Jesus' feet. And he didn't anoint him with oil. So anyway, as we kind of read on in the story, verse 37 tells us that while these, these important people are having this dinner, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life found out that Jesus was eating at Simon's house. And so what she did is she gathered this expensive perfume and she made her way over to Simon's house. While the dinner is going on, remember the courtyards were open so people could come and go. Even if you weren't invited, you could come into the courtyard and you could listen in on this important discussion that was happening around the dinner table. So this woman comes in, she goes right up to Jesus, she stands behind him, is overcome with emotion, and she begins to weep. Not just like cry, like weep, like the tears are flowing. So much so that her tears begin to wet Jesus' dirty, unwashed feet. She's probably all embarrassed that this is happening, so she does the unthinkable. She unties her hair. This is like, you don't do this as a woman. You only untie your hair in the presence of your husband. For a woman to untie her hair, it was so socially unacceptable. It was equivalent to her revealing her breasts. That's how bad it was. She unties her hair and she begins to wipe Jesus' feet with her hair. Then she kisses them. And the Greek word used here is to kiss over and over again. You can imagine this woman weeping. Her hair is all dirty. She's kissing his feet. And then she takes this alabaster jar of this expensive perfume and she pours it over the feet of Jesus. She is an absolute mess. The tears, the runny nose, the hair is all dirty. It's a mixture of mud and tears. It's, I mean, you can imagine. And the people there sitting around that table are shocked. They are sitting there in disbelief. How awkward, how embarrassing. Simon is livid. He mutters under his breath in verse 39. If this man were really a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of a woman she is, that she is a sinner. Now we're not told what this woman had done to be given this label, but it was clear that she had a reputation as being one who was disgusting and unclean and undignified and unspiritual. She was well known, she was more than likely a prostitute. And here this woman has the audacity to interrupt this dinner with all these big dogs of the day and then go over and touch a rabbi. Then unties her hair and rubs it all over Jesus. Who on earth does she think she is? Who on earth let this dirty pig inside this house? You see, if Jesus was a prophet, he would know A, who she was and what she'd done, and B, she, he would never allow her to come anywhere near him, let alone touch him. But verse 40 tells us that Jesus clearly is a prophet. Because Simon clearly says this thing under his breath, sort of, you know, no one kind of can hear what he's saying, but Jesus goes right there. 
He almost reads Simon's mind and, and addresses the issue and says to Simon, Simon, I, I've got something to tell you. Tell me, oh, holy and dignified teacher. So Jesus tells Simon a simple story. I almost said simple Simon a simple story. That would have been great. Here we go, verse 30, 41. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? The answer was obvious. You see, both men in the story had considerable debts that they owed. One man owed 50 denarii and the other 500. A denarius was the equivalent of a day's wage. In other words, one man would need to work back 50 days just to pay his debt and the other 500 days. In the story, both these men are metaphorical sinners. And Jesus is asking which one of these sinners would be more grateful and love the debt payer more? The one who had, maybe let's call him the 50 sinner or the 500 sinner? Simon is suspicious. He thinks he knows where Jesus is going with this, that Jesus is trying to get him into a corner. So he responds like this in verse 43. You can hear the tone of voice. I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You've judged correctly, Jesus replies to him. And then this thing happens in the middle of this kind of conversation. Jesus turns towards this woman. Look at verse 44. He turned toward the woman and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Of course I see this woman, Jesus. What are you talking about? I came into your house, Simon. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Simon, you did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. Oh, and Simon, you did not put oil on my head, but she has poured this expensive perfume on my feet. You see, Simon, we've got a problem here. I have been an unwelcome guest in your house. As soon as I set foot through your door, you treated me with contempt. It's very clear to me and to everybody else here that you don't want me in your home. You have not received me. You, Simon, have rejected me. And do you know why that's true, Simon? Do you know why you've rejected me? It's because actually you don't think that you need me. You don't think that there's much wrong in your life that needs forgiving. And therefore, you don't love me. I'd like to ask us a question this morning. Now, a couple of you people affirm that you know what it feels like to be uh, an unwelcome guest in someone's house. But let me ask this. Do any of you know what it feels like to be like Simon and to make Jesus feel unwelcome in your life? Where Jesus is an unwanted guest in the home of your heart. Where you say, I don't want anything to do with Jesus where you reject Jesus. If there is anyone here who can affirm and say, yes, that's me, you're more than likely finding it difficult to admit that. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if in this moment you're formulating some kind of a, a logical reason as to why that's the case. But if you're like Simon and you've rejected Jesus, it's because you don't think you have a need for him in your life. It's the first Sunday of the year. 
Often on the first Sunday of the year, we have people come to church who maybe have never come to church before, maybe haven't come to church in a long time. You may be here if it's your first time in a while or first time ever and you, are, you really wanna be here. But you may, there may be some people here this morning who've maybe kind of been dragged here by a well-meaning spouse or a friend. I don't know. I don't know where, where people are at this morning. But it could be that there are people here this morning who are convinced that they don't need Jesus. You might agree with me and, and you might say, yeah, okay, I'm not perfect. There, there are things in my life that I'm not proud of, but you know what? My, my good far outweighs the bad in my life. Therefore, I don't need a savior to, to deal with that bad because my life's good enough. And when I stand before him one day, I'll just play that card. Maybe you reject Jesus because um, you feel like Jesus and the people who are associated with him are nosy, they, they judgmental. Like, why, why are you sticking your nose in my business? Or maybe you reject Jesus because you think that your life is going fine without Christ and his Christianity. Why do I need Jesus? He's not gonna add any value to my life. My life is great. I've just gone on holiday. I've got a great family. I've got a great job. I live in Bryanston. I don't know. Okay, I hear you. I do hear you. That's you this morning. I understand those thoughts and those reasons. But I want us for a minute just to put those things aside and I want to share a little bit about my own heart. I'm a pastor and a Christian. I've been a Christian for a number of years, but I want to tell you about what my heart was like before any of these things. You see, I remember in high school, even earlier than high school, I started to understand something about my heart. I started to realize that deep down in my heart, there was an emptiness. There was a loneliness. There was an insecurity. There was a, an anxiety. There was a kind of a hidden sort of guilt and shame. Something was going on in my heart that made me feel uncomfortable. So uncomfortable that I was desperate for it to go away. And so what I started to do is I started to look to anything else anything around me to try and make those feelings go away, to try and solve this problem that I was facing in my heart. So I turned to relationships, sport, success, being popular, food, drink, whatever else I could kind of turn to that would just make me feel better about myself. Good things, mostly, but things that I made ultimate things, things that I relied on as the cure to solve my problem, to heal my broken heart. I made these things, these mini gods that I would serve, that I would give all my time and energy to, but ultimately, I made them mini gods that would serve the greatest God of all, and that was myself. I had no need for God, and I thought that all these things could solve the problem of my heart. I was desperate for them to save me from myself. And that's the definition of sin. This um, American preacher and author uh, says this, Tim, Ke Tim Keller, he says, sin is looking to something else besides God for your salvation. It is putting yourself in the place of God, becoming your own savior and Lord as it were. And that was me. I was looking to these things to save me and I was looking to myself ultimately to save myself. I turned to these things to, to give me life but they, they always overpromised, and they always underdelivered, And they ultimately left me feeling worse about myself and unfulfilled, more lonely, more empty, and unhappier than ever before. But it wasn't just the feelings that were an issue in my heart. You see, I had done things in my life that I wasn't proud of, 
and I felt guilty. And I had this sin problem that needed addressing and I tried to, to do things that would make me feel less guilty about those things, but they weren't working. Only God could deal with the sin pro problem in my life. I don't know if there's anyone here this morning who can relate to what I'm saying. You see, I, I, I'm guessing that, that there is. Because the thing is, the human heart is the human heart. And all of our hearts are the same. We all have broken, empty, unfulfilled hearts. We all have this thing called sin. We all make many gods out of the things in life. And we all use them to serve us. We all ultimately turn to some kind of self-salvation strategy. But the problem is that if we're like Simon, we're too prideful to admit that most of the time. We're too pr prideful to admit that we have a need. And we may convince ourselves that Jesus is unnecessary when only he can heal our hearts and forgive our sin. And as soon as he gets close to the home of our hearts, we, like Simon, decide that he's not welcome. You may show outward respect to him. You may come to church. You may say a prayer before you eat. That's okay. He can, he can exist. But as soon as he comes close to my home, as soon as he starts to put finger, his finger on things in my life, that's uncomfortable. And that's when we reject him. And I want us just for a moment here to get honest, to forget about any excuses or logical defenses that we may come up with and just to admit that yes, my heart feels those things. I can relate to what you're saying. I'm not as happy as I think I am. I'm not as good as I think I am. I am lonely, I am sad, I am fearful, I do feel shame and guilt. I do feel empty and I do acknowledge that there is this thing called sin in my life and I don't know how to get rid of it. Now you may be here this morning and you may be a Christian, but you can also call yourself a Christian and reject Jesus, did you know that? You see, like Simon, your religious life, your moral life, might not, we might not be able to fault it. But behind that religious veneer is a heart that is broken. Even though Jesus is in my life, I can tell you that my heart is insecure. I struggle with anxiety. I struggle with fear, with guilt, with shame. That's the human heart. But what we can do is sometimes I think as Christians, you know, we, we feel like we can't be vulnerable. We, we can't share those things with others because ooh, that, that's a sign of weakness. And so we, we put these masks on, we live these pretend lives. We come to church, we pretend like everything's fine, but our hearts are struggling. But no one is allowed to see what's really going on. Unfortunately, some of us harden our hearts, we won't admit this. And so we keep Jesus at bay. We rely on a once-off experience maybe where Jesus came into the home of our hearts, but every single day God is wanting access. Jesus is wanting access to the broken human heart. He wants to meet us there, but we can just keep him at bay. Maybe that's you. But the point is that we're all here today whether we call ourselves Christians or not, and we are the same. Our hearts are needy. I am no more special than any of you. My heart is needy. I sin big time. None of us are worse than anyone else. We all owe a huge debt. We like to compare ourselves and say, I'm only a 50 sinner, that person's a 500 but we all owe a debt that cannot be paid. We've fallen short and we need a savior. We need a savior. 
And I want us to turn our attention back to this woman who knew that she was a 500 sinner. She knew that her life was a mess, that she was living a life that was despicable. She hated herself. She knew she had a huge debt to pay. But she had a completely different reason for rejecting Jesus all of her life. The reason that she rejected Jesus all of her life was, she, was because she believed that Jesus, who was good, would never ever want anything to do with her. She walked around day after day with the townspeople heaping abuse on her, you're disgusting, sending all these messages. Her view of herself was lower than, than maybe anyone else's. And so she had rejected the idea that she could even approach Jesus. I, I don't have my act together. Jesus is not gonna welcome me. I may as well get him out of my mind. There's, there's no hope. But as we read the story, it's clear that something has changed. Something has changed for this woman as we see her bent over the feet of Jesus, her damp, quivering hands holding this vial of this, this concentrated ointment. She has come there to anoint his feet with this perfume. This doesn't sound like someone who's rejected Jesus. This doesn't sound like someone who's too afraid to enter into the presence of Jesus. What has happened? Why is she there? Why the change in heart? Why the sudden courage to interrupt this dinner party and even at the expense of more ridicule, come there at the feet of Jesus, be vulnerable, weep, wash his feet, pour this oil over. Why, why suddenly this change? Let's look again at verse 47. Jesus is speaking to Simon. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. This woman loved Jesus. She loved him, but, but how could you love someone that you're afraid of? Because I think that somewhere, somehow, there was an unrecorded personal interaction between Jesus and this woman before this dinner party. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe like that sinful woman at the well that we read about in John 4, Jesus comes up to this woman at some point and he starts a conversation with her. And she, she wants to hide. She doesn't want to get into a conversation. She knows who this is. But Jesus starts to ask her questions about her life. And before long, maybe she, she can't hide any longer. And she thinks that Jesus is gonna, I don't know, stone her or reject her or tell her about how hell's coming for her. But instead, as Jesus sees her in her fullness, sees the depths of that broken heart, sees the, the debt of sin that she owes, what does he do? He doesn't treat her as an unwelcome guest. He welcomes her. He loves her. He smiles at her. He forgives her. He satisfies this deep longing in her heart. Can you imagine this woman in this moment and what that kind of love and mercy would have done for her? How is it possible? This kind of love and grace would have radically changed her. Why do I need to live the life that I've been living anymore? I'm running to those things to fill this heart, but now in this moment with Jesus, my heart is full. I don't need that in my life anymore. I don't need to worry about what people think of me anymore. The savior of the world loves me. I don't need to walk in shame. This man has given me reason to hope, reason to live again. He's rescued me from darkness. And her heart was filled with gratitude that words can't describe. And she loved this Jesus. And she was willing to do anything to love him and to follow him. And so when she came with this little jar of, of ointment to anoint Jesus' feet, it was just a small gesture of gratitude for this man who had loved 
and forgiven her. Some of you here this morning may be rejecting Jesus on a day-to-day basis because you don't think he wants you. Maybe you're ashamed of the life you've lived. Maybe you're ashamed of the life you're living. Maybe there's stuff in your life that people don't know about that you feel this guilt over. Maybe you have an ongoing addiction to something. We can be addicted to anything, some substance, alcohol, drugs. Maybe you have a porn addiction. Maybe you're addicted to work. Maybe you have real anger issues. Maybe you're a gossip. Maybe you lie, you steal, you cheat. Maybe you've had an affair. Maybe you're living some double life. I don't know. But you say, Jesus doesn't want me. He wants people who've got it together. Well, seems as though we've just had Christmas. I'd like to tell us a little Christmas story. Imagine this little boy and uh, his dad comes up to him at the beginning of the year and, and, and says to him, what would you like for Christmas? And he says, Daddy, I, all I want for Christmas is a Barney Teddy. You know Barney the dinosaur? A Barney Teddy, my son. Is that it? Y- yes, Dad, that, that's all I want for Christmas. I just want a Barney Teddy. Okay, my son. So the year goes on and this little boy starts to dream about this Barney Teddy. He starts to talk to his friends about this Barney Teddy that he's gonna get. And you can imagine Christmas morning. He's been counting down the sleeps. Christmas morning comes and he rushes to the Christmas tree and there underneath the tree is this beautiful red box. His dad takes the red box and hands it to this excited little boy and his hands start to tremble. He is so excited to open this box because he thinks inside this box is his Barney Teddy. So with trembling hands, he slowly lifts off the lid of the box and his eyes light up with joy and there is a huge smile on his face because slowly, out of the box, he lifts up his Barney Teddy. (laughs) Barney, it's so beautiful! Oh, I love it! I love this Barney! Thank you, Daddy! This is all I've ever wanted! A Barney Teddy! Thank you, Daddy! Oh, this is amazing! Thanks, Dad! Am I the only one who sees that this is broken? Little boy, are you blind? Barney's head is ripped off his body. There is fluff pouring out. He doesn't have a leg. Why do you want this Barney? Throw it away. This is a horrible Christmas present. It's a horrible toy. Daddy can get you a fixed one. Oh, no. No, I want this one. You want this this broken one? I want this one. Yes, I, I love this one. This is mine. I love it. I know it's broken, I'm not stupid, but I don't love it any less because it's broken. I I love it because it's mine. I love it because it's mine from my father. It's, It's a gift to me. This is my Barney. And I hate the fact that it's broken because I'm sure Barney doesn't wanna be broken. I'm sure it hurts Barney to be broken. So, so I'm gonna do whatever it takes to fix this Barney. I promise you I'm gonna fix this Barney but no one's taking Barney away from me. This is my Barney. I love this Barney. Guys, we're all like Barney. We're broken. Our hearts are broken. My heart is broken. It's a mess. And we've all sinned. We are desperate for love. We are desperate for someone to heal our broken hearts. We are desperate for someone to make us beautiful and whole again. 
And our Father in heaven, God, gave Jesus a gift. One that Jesus loves and desires with all his heart. One that he thinks about all the time. We're the gift, but we're broken. Broken. We don't deserve to be given to one so perfect as a gift. And yet he adores us. He loves us. He hates that we're broken. He hates sin and he, and he hates how, how our brokenness is, is hurting us and destroying us. But he says the same thing to us as he said to the woman in the story. Your sins are forgiven. Your brokenness will be healed. How is this, how is this possible? How, how does he have the authority to do this? Because like the little boy in the Christmas story, he was committed to doing anything to fix it, to fix brokenness. And he did. We owe a 500 debt which we can never hope to repay. You can live as good a life as you want to. It'll never be good enough. It'll never be enough to pay back the debt of sin against God. We can never ever do enough to heal our own broken hearts. The only way that this can be done is when one who is perfect loves another who is not and pays a price so high, the spilling of his own blood, the death, the giving up of his own life. And like Barney, Jesus had his body ripped up torn to shreds and broken in an excruciating death called crucifixion. It's not just some story, go and read about it, it's horrific. A death that all of us deserve, all of us. There is not one here who can claim that we don't deserve that. And then on the cross, Jesus uttered these amazing words. Father, forgive them. And in verse 49, the other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? What a great question. Who is this? Who are we talking about here? This, my friends, is Jesus. This is Jesus who is like no one else. This is Jesus who is perfect. This is Jesus who loves the broken. This is Jesus who is filled with compassion. This is Jesus who forgives the sinner. This is Jesus who we all need. We have nothing without him. We cannot do 2020 apart from him. There is no hope in life apart from Jesus. And this Jesus is not high and mighty somewhere where we can't reach. He came down to earth because he wants us. He wants us so much, you and I. And when you open up your heart, your broken heart, your insecure, empty heart, you open it up even if you're afraid and you let Jesus in there. You don't treat him as an unwelcome guest. Do you know what happens? He changes you. He changes your life. He fills you with a love and a peace and a joy like you've never experienced. This is Jesus who I am calling you today to no longer reject. I'm calling you to receive him into your life. Your heart, your life will change. He's waiting, he wants you. So I'm gonna ask the worship team to come up and I want us just to sit for a, for a minute in silence and to think about these things. And if you feel as though you need him this morning in your life, I'm calling you to do business with him, to receive him. So let's close our eyes, all of us, Let's be quiet for a minute.
Jesus has touched you this morning. I want you just to, as I pray, I'm gonna pray out these words and I would love for you to respond in your heart if you need to and just under your breath, just to, to repeat these words. Jesus, I do need you. I can't fool anyone. I am empty. I am lost, I am broken, I've sinned against you. Forgive me, Lord, and heal my broken heart. Come into the home of my heart this morning and fill me with love and peace and the life that I long for. I want to be with you. I want to know you. I want to know relationship with you. So today I choose to believe that you paid my debt and I receive it with gratitude. And I choose to believe that today you fill me with life and that you are committed to healing my broken heart. I turn from my old ways and I choose to walk with you in obedience. I receive you, Jesus.